I'm in the Oakland Police Department to deliver an implicit bias training. I, two years earlier, had been invited uh, by the city and by a federal monitor to come in to help uh, the Oakland Police Department with their reform efforts. Um, so there's some terrible things that happened that had to do with race and racial profiling and you know, false arrests and <laughs> you name it. Uh, so they wanted to bring in what they call a subject matter expert to analyze the data and to see, you know, to what extent there were racial disparities there um, in their enforcement activities. I'd been there and we analyzed the data. I, I worked with a team of Stanford researchers uh, to do that and we were about to release a report um, to the public uh, on our findings. And so there was, you know, pretty significant uh, racial disparities. And so I was, um, you know, trying to sort of figure out um, sort of what b the best course of action was in terms of preparing the department um, for the results. And so, for example, 28% of the uh, population as a whole in Oakland is African American. Um, but we found that um, over 60% of the people who were stopped were African American. And we found you know, similar disparities in terms of searches and in terms of handcuffing and arrest and so forth. So I had a sense of how the department would respond you know, to this. And so I was thinking also um, that I had some sense of how the community would respond. And, and that was to um, sort of demand uh, the department take you know, some action. And that would include um, training on you know, an implicit bias. And so because I'm a researcher uh, who studies this, I thought um, one um, suggestion might be uh, for them to get this training. And I definitely did not want to give them this training <laughs> after the report was released because I figured, um, you know, I'd already lost them at that point and they wouldn't be there and present and listening and so forth. So I decided I wanted to do the training um, beforehand. And so I go in and I'm sort of trying to train uh, the whole department within a couple weeks uh, period before the report's release. And uh, so I have my first session and I have 132, you know, uniformed officers sitting there in the auditorium sort of waiting for me to take the stage. So they had on a bulletproof vest and they had uh, taut faces and sort of their uh, eyes were distant. And I, uh, I knew I had a problem right on my hands and I could feel a chill in the room. So I started in and started sort of talking, you know, with the slides and I would talk about bias and I was, um, you know, sort of trying to connect with them. But whatever I did, I just couldn't make a connection. And I, you know, tried jokes that didn't work and uh, demonstrations that didn't work. And I uh, tried showing videos uh, that, um, you know, really sort of got people engaged in other settings, nothing. And so I decided to stop and just to tell a story. And uh, the story I, I told was about my son, who um, was five years old at the time, and we were on an airplane together. And right, so he's looking all around, and he um, sees a, uh, a man on the plane, and he says, hey, that guy looks like daddy. And so I look at the guy, and he doesn't look anything at all like daddy. I mean, nothing, you know. And I'm like, what is he talking about? So then I start looking around on the plane, and I notice he was the only black man on the plane. And I thought, OK, you know, I'm going to have to have a talk with my five-year-old about how not all black people look alike, right? <laughs> so I'm like, all right. You know, so I'm trying to think, you know, how am I going to have this conversation in the language that a five-year-old can understand? But before I launched into, into the lecture, I thought, you know, children see the world differently from adults, and they see people in a way that's different. You know, they haven't been trained across years to kind of see people in certain ways. And so maybe there was some resemblance there that I just wasn't seeing. I decide I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to look at this guy and look for any resemblance. And so um, I look at him. I look at his height. And he's about four inches shorter than my husband. Nothing there. And so I look at his weight. Nothing there. I look at his um, facial features. Nothing. I look at his uh, skin color. You know, nothing there. And then I look at his hair. And he has um, these long dreadlocks flowing down his back. And my husband's bald. <laughs> and I thought. All right, so I'm all ready to give him the talk. And before I could say anything, he looks up and he says, 
I hope he doesn't rob the plane. <laughs> and I said, what? What did you say? And he said it again. He says, well, I, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, you know daddy wouldn't rob a plane. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know. And I said, well, why would you say that? And he looked at me with this really sad face and he said, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I was thinking that. We're living with such severe racial stratification that even a five-year-old can tell us what's supposed to happen next. So I stood there in this auditorium in the Oakland Police Department and I, I uh, told that story and you know, hoping again for a, a connection. And I wanna just read um, just a little bit from the book of, of what happened when I looked out at the crowd. I took a deep breath and when I looked back out at the crowd in the auditorium, I saw that the expressions had changed. Their eyes had softened. They were no longer uniformed police officers and I was no longer a university researcher. We were parents unable to protect our children from a world that is often bewildering and frightening, a world that influences them so profoundly, so insidiously, and so unconsciously that they and we don't know why we think the way we do. Thank you.